Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of IHL and Film. We are continuing from our discussion on Oppenheimer. We have a, a wonderful new direction that we want to take this, and we have with us a uh, general creative genius and one half of my favorite cooking show, Cooking Chaos, uh, AR, uh, here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Second time on. Yeah, second time on. Second time's the charm. <laughs> yeah. Right? No. Uh, whenever he comes on, we get this, uh, you know, this huge burst in, in likes and comments from uh, yeah. the, what is it, 12 to 13 year old? 12 uh, to Democrat. 14 maximum, yeah. Many female. Yeah, yeah, we don't go any wonderful. further than that. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and that's really the demographic that we are targeting yes, as well. Exactly. So there's this Without natural convergence <laughs> between our, our two shows. Because naturally, international law and cooking chaos, they, they go uh, yeah, hand exactly. in hand. Um, we're still, you know, I'm waiting for the, uh, for the, you know, the invitation to, to come on cooking chaos. Next time. But <laughs> we're shooting tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I have to cancel my plans to go to Islamabad now. <laughs> uh, my kids can wait. No, uh, but anyway, so, so today what we're going to be discussing is a very interesting letter that was written by Robert Oppenheimer to Einstein. And this is a like a, a genuine thing this is not we're so not something sure, we don't i don't know like the veracity has been Question. debated and questioned and all this okay. kind of stuff it's actually a a document written by both oppenheimer and einstein together okay wow and uh, the the i don't know what you want to call it the document is top secret it's part of the majestic documents which were considered at june uh, 1947 <laughs> and it's titled relationships with inhabitants of celestial bodies wow yeah which is longhand for aliens exist. Aliens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Einstein said it. Yeah. Right. We're done here. Okay, yeah. why don't we start by like how did you get into all of this stuff? I got into the rabbit hole because about a month and a half ago, I think, mm -hmm. recent news this is that uh, a whistleblower came out, uh, a whistleblower by the name of David Grush. He's a decorated US uh, Army officer. And he worked in the intelligence agency for about 10 years or so. Or I don't know the exact credentials. Please do put them if you can. But I don't know the exact statistics or whatever. But he was basically part of like the UAP task force, which was designated to investigate unidentified anomalous phenomenon. And after about four years of interviewing around 40 different first-hand witnesses, he then blew the whistle essentially and came out and said, okay, this uh, the there has been a massive crash retrieval program. Oh wow! And uh, the U.S. has around he said around a fair number of spacecraft, either crashed or retrieved by some other means, and they also have non-human biologics biologics that came with the craft. That's and the f interesting thing is the crazy thing is that this has all happened in Congress, in a hearing publicly viewed. You can watch it, the whole Congress meeting as well. Um, and it happened just this last month and it's all under oath. So obviously if he's lying, he's committing perjury and he could go to jail. And um, if it's true, then it's just the most shocking news that has ever happened in the history of humankind. And, and I think importantly, he's not alone. He's they, not alone. They, there exactly. were two other um, witnesses as well who testified. Oh, really? Exactly. Okay. There were, well, there were two. Yeah, there were two. Uh, <clears throat> Navy. There was there was a Air Force pilot, a Navy pilot. Or, exactly, uh, exactly. There was a Navy pilot, Ryan Graves, and there was another uh, commander, <clears throat> Navy commander uh, David Fraber, and they their accounts were interesting because they were first hand accounts of UAP phenomenon. So Ryan Graves is a bit of a younger pilot. He said that he saw these things every day when he was training. Wow. And he would zip, they would actually, he said his, his, uh, his uh, colleagues would be like zipping past them on their entry points into their training fields. Wow. And so he's saying, he was saying it from a, a, a safety point of view, mm -hmm. that these things are not safe to have in our airspace. We don't know what they are. Like we're flying around these things and yeah. we're in multi-million dollar jets, fighter planes, mm -hmm. and there's stuff here that we don't know what they are. And then when we, when we tell them to our superiors, they just say, okay. That's it. They don't. Okay. They don't say like, well, we have to pull everyone off the range right now. What is in these? What is in the sky? Even if it's just a balloon. Yeah. They just say, okay. Wow, that's that's really interesting. Okay, but why does this only happen to Americans? It doesn't only happen to Americans. It's a fallacy that it's only happened to America. Actually, there's been a lot of sightings, UFO sightings, and um, big events that have happened. Trying not to sound like a UFO nut. <laughs> no, no, now we're in the rabbit hole. Ah, you speak, no, you okay, 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 you okay. speak your truth, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's been a lot of incidents around the world 
there was a, a videotaped sighting in Turkey. Uh, there's been an incident in uh, Varjana in Brazil that was like uh, a mass sighting. And it I had think, multiple, mul yeah. uh, you know, witnesses to it. It yeah. wasn't just a single event or, you know, one exactly. crazy person saying something. Exactly. There has been, um, where was there? There was this consideration. They've been in Africa. The, in Africa. In Africa, in Zimbabwe. Multiple, yeah. multiple sightings as well of craft where the entire village saw it or entire groups of people mm. saw it. Uh, there's been a lot in Russia. Yes. Um, where, uh, you know, they've, they've track these things and, and so I've gone down my own hole. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, I, I just, I'm so better. So why don't you believe this? <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm better at hiding it than him. Otherwise, I've, I've gone through. Yeah, you don't have YouTube. the crazy eyes. <laughs> 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 YouTube is, is, a, is a dangerous place. Right? Yeah. Uh, anyway. But the interesting thing is, yeah, sure, it's, it is actually international. Like this, the, uh, UFO sightings do happen all over, uh, all over the world. And they have been documented even by governments across the world. But the interesting thing is that this is not even in the last 80 years. This has been spanning centuries. So there's a really interesting case, uh, Celestial. Uh, it was it was written in a newspaper, and they they created a really beautiful like wood. Uh, an, an artist created a really beautiful wooden block engraving of this thing. He called it the, the Celestial Phenomenon over Nuremberg in 1561. Wow. So in 1561, they said they had spheres in the air mm -hmm. and big triangular objects. So they were, look exactly like they look on sci-fi films then. The flying saucers and the aliens with the weird heads and... I mean, obviously we don't know. We don't have pictures. We don't know what they actually look like, right? But from witness accounts and all these kind of things, it seems like... Again, this is rumor, conjecture, whatever. But uh, Steven Spielberg was uh, approached by members of the intelligence agency when he was making Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Like, he says this openly. Wow. They said, we will help you making this film. And so you never know how much the disinformation campaign goes. Like, even when David Grush came out, he said, there has been an extremely sophisticated disinformation campaign being run against the American people about UFOs. Part of that could be f seeding fiction Mm. To make it seem even more bizarre, right? It's like, well, I've seen that in the movies. How can yeah, that be yeah. real? So, uh, yeah, what I wanted to ask you is, we've seen a spate of releases from the government, right? Mm. We've seen like a few years ago they had uh, the aircraft, uh, sorry, the Air Force footage that was released with the Tic Tac that was zooming across the ocean. We had, um, you know, a bunch of these coming out. Why do you yeah. think this is happening, and why do you think it's happening all of a sudden right now? Um, not sure, really. Yeah, it's just. It's not what your sister says. Your sister says you think it's a soft introduction to, to the world. Where I do think that like this, because so the whole thing really started this latest disclosure event happened in 2017 when the New York Times broke exactly the story, the Tic Tac story, yeah. that the US Navy has literal footage taken from FLIR, which is forward, uh, forward looking infrared cameras on okay. their planes. So that's all the footage that we've seen is from yeah, FLIR yeah. systems, infrared systems that very high definition, like crazy expensive military grade uh, surveillance systems. And so they've said that, that the whole thing started from that piece in the New York Times in 2017, that where people think this might be soft disclosure. How could they release these? How could the Pentagon be declassifying this yeah. very crazy footage if they think with multiple eyewitness accounts as well? Mm -hmm. So it's not just like it couldn't be a glitch. Like Commander Frager had eyes on this thing for like 20 minutes, he said, or I don't know however long he had eyes on it for, but yeah. Why it's happening now, I have no idea. Okay, but if they're here and mm. we know about them, then they've made contact, we are not alone. That's, the biggest that's, that's not necessarily are... true, true if they have made contact, con contact or not. Like, I mean, what if they're just roaming around sightseeing and then some crash, they recover the vehicle and they haven't really come and said, hey, <laughs> okay, so, right. so my take on this is that they're not interplanetary, they're just interdimensional. Like, these are jinn. For us, these are jinn. No? Well, David Grush did say in his testimony to Congress, he said that um, they don't use the term extraterrestrial beings anymore. Extraterrestrial uh, uh, intelligence or whatever. They now use the term non-human intelligence. Because they don't want to, he said, we want to keep the aperture open. In his, he, in his testimony, he said, we want to keep the aperture open because there is hypothesis of like extra dimensional beings as well that if they exist in a dimension above our four dimensions 
we had three spatial dimensions mm -hmm. and one dimension of time, mm -hmm. they have maybe exist in 10 dimensions or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and what we see of them is just them like poking their head, projecting into our dimension and then projecting back out. Uh, I guess they must be discussing this in the intelligence agencies or whatever top secret so, programs. So what's know the term? About this. They don't call them extraterrestrial. Non-human intelligence. Non-human intelligence. <laughs> the, the aliens have you know come to Earth, hmm. right? And they have visited us, and they want to, you know, have first contact. Make uh, you know how would that go? How do we even conceptualize um, speaking to them or engaging with them or communicating with them? Um. There has been some conjecture, again, it's all rumor conjecture, but that the US government has had agreements with these beings. Oh, wow. That is one, I think David Grush did say that in his News Nation interview, you can splice it in, that yes, there have been agreements between non-human intelligence and the US government. I don't know how, obviously, that's it's a huge claim to make. But I guess the thing is that if, if you were going to... I think there's two interesting things about this, which is one, that there's been a huge cover-up if this is true, mm -hmm. that there's been, you've been lying to, the, to people for potentially uh, decades, Even, since, yeah. since Roswell, since like 1930s, when they, uh, I think they said the first crash was in uh, Mussolini's Italy in 1930, the Magenta incident. That's when they first think that they, there was a crash, a crash retrieval program began then. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been lying to the, to humanity for decades, these top secret organizations. So th that's one issue. The second issue is that then obviously you have extraterrestrial beings or non-human intelligence. What do you do with it? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that information now? Um, so yeah, the first thing is you lie to people. And then the second thing is that now you have to deal with the fact that you have, you we're not alone. So this, this lying aspect, I think from a legal perspective might be justifiable if, because a lot of all actions have to be done in public good. Right? National security, National security yeah. public good. And you can have disinformation to promote that. You can have misinformation to, you know, get your enemies on some other trail and things like that. So maybe for this, it could be justified mm. on those grounds. That yeah. For the public good, for to prevent panic in society, to prevent, you know, a breakdown in our understanding of the world. Mm. Right? We need something. And the second thing is, I mean, just looking at it, if today we found out, we've found, you know, incontrovertible evidence that aliens exist, that would scare a lot of people right? yeah uh, and s because what that implies is that there is a power there's a being that is stronger than you that's stronger than any country in the world yeah. with technology that far exceeds your own so far you are exceeds. Yeah. yeah and so you because are now the notion in a, of non-human intelligence is more intelligence than right. they are capable of yeah, yeah. yeah. this is not single cellular yeah, organism yeah. we're talking about we're talking about you know i mean exactly. if they're dumber than we are <laughs> Yeah. Game over. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, but, but, but if you look at it historically, you know, let's reverse the situation. We go and we become a, you know, interplanetary species and we go and discover, you know, uh, a, a group of people living on some other planet or some aliens or like that. Traditionally, we haven't had a very good relationship with discovering new people, <laughs> right? Yeah. We've enslaved them. Yeah. We have abused them. We've stolen their gold and we've killed them and, and things like that, right? What prevents them from doing that to us? That, that's, I think that's where this Einstein Oppenheimer document is really interesting because they say like, who has rights over anything? Like even they, they actually say about the moon, is, is the moon, they call it, I don't know if this is a, a law term or whatever, they call it a res nullius. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How is that pronounced? Uh, yeah. 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 Like, so no man's land. No man's land. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they were like, if they come there, what do, what, do we have any, do we consider the moon as ours? Because mm. you feel like, hey, that's mine. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> as a human being, you're like, that's, it's, so it's interesting I see that every day. We also have treaties about, we have a moon treaty, we have an outer space treaty. And the objective of those was to prevent an arms race in space and also to prevent exploitation of the moon. Mm. So the moon can't be colonized. You can't be like, this is ours. There is not going to be that kind of out fighting in outer space. But these were made in the 1960s. And at the start of the space. These were made for humans. Yes. Mm. So you, yeah. it's, a, it's a planet that already recognizes the jurisdiction over this uh, orbiting body, the moon. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're dividing it up amongst ourselves. But now there's a completely different body that is also perhaps laying claim onto the moon. 
what would be the, our grounds for jurisdiction? The fact that it's orbiting our planet, yeah. that would be then grounds yeah. for it, right? And, and also looking at it in terms of, okay, say if we do destroy the planet through climate change, mm. and that's why Elon Musk is like, I'm going to look at, go to Mars, find yeah. out if we can live on Mars, let's find out if we can live on the moon, let's have commercial flights to the moon. The, what will happen then is that the most powerful states will lay their stake there. The most powerful states will have rich enough uh, individuals who are able to, to travel to the moon. But how then do you compete for resources on a completely new planet if you are competing with non-human intelligence? Mm. I mean, if, the, if, if they have the technology that we think that they have, which is yeah. that, and that has been observed to be had, which is that they experience no inertia, they can move from, uh, I think, zero to Mach 3 in like three seconds or something like stuff that is physically impossible for us, mm. then we don't have a chance militarily against them. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you that if, you know, there is this technological disadvantage that we're at and we've already seen aliens here, why have they already destroyed us or enslaved us or taken all our resources? Isn't that a valid question there? Uh, it is like, like let's just like pure speculation, yeah. Um, and just like uh, jumping in the rabbit hole and having fun with it. What if they are like say that you have um, ability to transport through maybe wormholes or something or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, but the actual I love movement. I'm saying like let's just have fun with this. As if this isn't a deeply held belief. That <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's <laughs> just yeah. having fun. Guys. I don't believe this, <laughs> except with every fiber of my being. <laughs> Sorry, no, like, um, like for instance, uh, a von Neumann probe, that's actually a scientific principle, right? They think that if there were extraterrestrial beings, they would have sent out von Neumann probes. I think the scientist was called von Neumann who posited the idea that they would send out probes into the universe to try and see if there was extraterrestrial or, or sort of to see if there was intelligent life anywhere that they, or habitable worlds that they could inhabit. So what we might be seeing are the probes currently. Mm -hmm. And the actual fleet or the actual thing is on the way, which would take many thousands of light years perhaps to reach us. Ah, then someone else's problem, not us. <laughs> yeah. Right. So this is like the first boat coming of the East India Company. Exactly. And then they're like, It's like oh. also like the three body problem. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was just going to say, so have you read the three body problem? No, I don't Which think is so. a Chinese sci-fi um, trilogy and it's incredible um and it's about this world called trisolaris which has yeah Cut spoiler alert a trisolaris which has three suns orbiting and okay. they figured out that actually you can't live like that so they have to come out and they have to seek new life and so they're coming to earth and they're telling you oh we're coming we're going to be here in this time and they're like we don't understand why they're telling us everything and uh what they so the liken, humans don't understand why they're telling yeah what they liken it to is that you don't hide bug spray from the bug oh. and so it's like that and I, it was such a power it was such a powerful yeah. image and i'm like oh what if they're <laughs> yeah no but are they are they showing this uh malevolent intent from the get-go like they're saying we're coming to exterminate yeah you? yeah oh, we wow. need to find yeah. somewhere else yeah yeah and exactly. i think that that's a bit like um uh the movie um what was it arrival where where the uh well, you know, the, these aliens coming to give you a warning or so? They were giving, they were, yeah. they were helping us out, actually. Yeah, Those were more benevolent aliens. Exactly. With the next wave that is going to come is going right. to destroy us and things yeah, like yeah. that, right? Or, or, or yeah, they said there were, yeah, they said there was, uh, so in the movie, I think it's the heptapods mm -hmm. say that we've given you a gift of some kind of technology, which is to of be language. able to perceive time differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. A language that helps you predict the future. Yeah. That would be yeah. so bad. And that yeah. will then, yeah. yeah it's really oh, cool. and, and the whole notion of language being a tool. Right? Yeah. That you can wield. Sapper Whorf hypothesis is apparently that the language that you learn. Can you say that again? Sapper Whorf hypothesis. Okay, okay. It's Sapper. like two, I guess, two psychologists mm -hmm. or whatever name put together. Their hypothesis that you, the language you learn uh, um, directly affects, affects the way your brain works. Oh, absolutely. So mm. if you have a language that works in a way that interprets time differently, then you mm. might be able to, like, you know, if you have different words for love, right? You might not be able to. Um, a language that has no words for love might not be able to feel that emotion as deeply as some other language that has a lot of words for it. Like this is, yeah, well, this is a silly, a silly, a silly example. No, but you no, know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a great example. I mean, you have languages where uh, to say right or left, they would say west or east, okay. right? Or, or it's based on north and, and direction. So people in those cultures are very good at navigating, right? Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a culture which just says right or left and right. doesn't really um, have the entire, uh, you know, your surroundings involved in that, 
it's a completely yeah, different thing. People yeah. aren't as good as navigating uh, there. So these are, uh, you know, very, very interesting um, discussions there. So um, one of the, the potentials that we have is that we have this catastrophic army that is coming. And much like, say, the movie Independence Day, where we see, you know, the, the bad guys coming in, they're destroying cities, and then we have our Air Force pilots and Will yeah. Smith going in and yeah. saving the world. Right? Is there any technology that we have that could, you know, serve as, as uh, and since this is linked to Opp Oppenheim, I'm trying to hint at nuclear weapons. Yeah. Right? Is it something that, you know, for sure. Be? That's the main hypothesis, actually, is that these beings have actually in the document that Oppenheimer and Einstein have supposedly written. Um, uh, can I just read out this little yeah, paragraph? Yeah. Lastly, we should consider the possibility that our atmospheric tests of late could have influenced the arrival of celestial scrutiny. They could have been curious or even alarmed by such activity, and rightly so, for the Russians would make every effort to observe and record such tests. In conclusion, is our, our professional opinion, based on submitted data, that this situation is extremely perilous, and measures must be taken to rectify a very serious problem, a very apparent, respectfully, Oppenheimer and Albert Einstein. So, I think they do think that the, the nuclear weapons is something that causes them some concern. A lot. Because, In terms of their heightened activity? Yeah. They, you I refer mean, at UAP uh, activity? So, again, conjecture, complete conjecture, but there is, the, uh, there is one uh, account, eyewitness account, from a uh, nuclear base that the, they saw a UAP hovering over an atomic weapons testing facility. I don't, I don't know the exact details, sorry, but and uh, they shut the nukes down when they were about to do a test. Oh, wow. um, and there is other uh, conjecture that this actually led to the hotline um, agreement between the Russians and the Americans, because there is this clause in the hotline agreement between JFK and the Russians at the time. This was at like the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Which basically said that, you know, if we see something over our tests or if there's something that we do not identify, there will be a direct phone line between the president of America, of the United States and I guess, Khrushchev, and Khrushchev yeah. who would basically be like, this is not us, basically. Like, this is not a rogue ICBM or whatever. This is not a rogue te yeah, yeah, nuclear yeah. test or something. This is so, uh, something else is happening. And that's why there's conjecture that that might be the reason why they created that hotline agreement, which is basically because stuff was in their skies and they had no idea. And they thought it was the Russians. The Russians were like, that's not us. Wow. Yeah. Well, absolutely. That's, so that's nuclear weapons is seems interesting. To, they seem to have a problem with it, is what the rumor is. So what I've heard is that since nuclear tests and since we've had the technology of nuclear weapons, there have been an enhanced number of uh, sightings mm -hmm. near these facilities, right? Um, I don't know how, you know, I don't have any data to, yeah, to back yeah. that up, but this is, you know, when you go down this rabbit hole, this is the, the type just of information. For yeah, <laughs> just, just for, I mean, we're not yeah. really discussing this at all. <laughs> <laughs> but just for, so, so that's something that I, I think is, is quite interesting. It reminds me of, of um, there was this, this live performance by George Clooney and a bunch of others on um, where they were, uh, there were the crew of this uh, bomber, nuclear, uh, and it was new, it was going to drop a nuclear bomb on Moscow or, or, or something like that. And they were under orders that if you are activated, if you have to go on this mission, you have been trained. They, they were trained not to listen to any other orders. So even right. if the president of the U.S. came on board and told them abort, abort. So wrongfully, for some reason, these guys get activated, and the entire live performance is the president of the U.S. telling them stop it. He's in touch with the with the uh, with the Soviets. And he's saying that, oh my God, you know, uh, we can't control them. Can you shoot them down? Can you do something? Okay. And they eventually, uh, you know, he's still on the line with the Russians and suddenly their line drops because they've dropped the, the missiles. So the right. only, so to prevent nuclear war, mm. the Americans bomb one of their own cities with a nuclear bomb. Oh, right. And, oh. And that's, uh, to make it seem to like this. Yeah, to so, make so it this fair. Is something, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this was something oh. that was, that was interesting. It could have been the hotline that they used, right? Yeah. Where yeah. they were saying, you know, this is not us. It's happened. And you see this with a lot, like, I mean, there were a number of Soviet commanders who refused orders. I think it was a submarine commander during the, was it Cuban Missile Crisis or was it something else, where he was basically, the, the requirements to fire 
were had been met, but he deliberately didn't fire. Wow. Because okay. and that oh, prevented. Oh yes, there was that mistake on the radar. Exactly. Right? It was showing something yeah, blue yeah, yeah. and it wasn't. And then he was like, "Oh well, this is what the computer is telling me, but I don't think that there's exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so we have those those incidents. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if if nuclear weapons were our secret uh, weapon against them, yeah, uh, that's why another reason to have nuclear weapons. <laughs> it's, uh, I think we should give it to everyone. Right? <laughs> Mass so, or it could be it could weapons. be that they. Have some bene benevolence to them. They don't want to see a habitable planet uh, reduced to ash, or they don't want to see intelligent life destroyed. Maybe they I think mean, that it, they do think it's worthy. Even they are much maybe more evolved than us, or whatever you want to call it, but they do still see value in it. Potentially, and also the argument that they could be our future ancestors. There's yeah. that theory, right? Future ancestors. Yeah. So <laughs> that. Oh, they could be our future selves. Our fu sorry, yes. This yeah. is the ancestor yeah, theory. Uh, <laughs> we are the, sorry. Yeah, that's a cool yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, this, this, this one's that's like a sci-fi term, though, right? It sounds oh, yeah, like I'm it. the crazy one, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she made a grammatical mistake. <laughs> what a loon. <laughs> no, the, so the ancestor theory that we're their ancestors and they're yeah. kind of coming back and... Um, yeah. Trying to help us out. Yeah, in some way. Because, uh, especially if, if time doesn't work the way it does for us in that it's linear, um, yeah. Also, say, suppose they are rational beings, uh, they have a psychology that is somewhat similar to us, they meet the requirements in, in the letter. Um, would we be able, would we be applying the same laws that we have here, mm. right? Because it becomes yeah. a completely different ball game to an extent. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and, and for example, you decide that you want to have trade with them. Right, um, you would have to know what they want, mm -hmm. and then you would have to have caps that don't destroy your own planet, um, and you would want to know what you can get from them. Right? Right. Is it something that is even compatible with your chemistry, biochemistry, your your survival in this uh, uh, on this planet? So I think there's there's a lot. So you would have to have like a, a new GATT arrangement or a yeah. new World Trade Organization, and also what rules they hold dear in their society exactly like for us um i mean going back to ihl distinction is so important you combatant privilege combatant immunity civilian protection what if that death is not a big deal yeah, so yeah. why would you they don't oh, believe that killing of one person okay. is a big yeah thing. yeah it's not important at all uh, or maybe life is so sacred to them mm -hmm. that the notion that people should die in wars is horrific for them yeah, they're yeah. like oh you're allowed to kill a combatant that's that's you know, completely yeah. unacceptable. Yeah, I, I think another question would be: Is if we were, if this was a, a adversarial relationship where they're coming to attack us or something, would we play by the rules of IHL? Yeah, are they yeah. even human or high contracting parties yeah. for that purpose? Yeah, um, for say human rights law to apply, does it apply extraterritorially to say their planet if we go and mm -hmm. attack them? Yeah, if Ex they're extraterrestrially, extraterrestrially, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you would need guys, a super ICCPR applies to you. <laughs> you have the right to life. <laughs> and there's no like uh, you don't have like the United Nations. It says in the letter that it's only between nations that they have mm. agreements, right? But you don't have anything that can make a decision based on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is like if we ultimately have, um, if we ultimately have, you know, uh, we colonize Mars. We're gonna have to have rules to deal with them as well. Yeah. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to end the discussion, even though I'd love to discuss this further. Yeah. It, it, it is something that I have hidden for much uh, of my life, but it's it's really a rabbit hole that we've enjoyed going down. Thank you so much, Ehar, for coming. Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, till the next episode, do let us know if there's anything else you want us to review, any other conspiracy theories, we're there for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.